everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We will be starting shortly when everybody has connected. Let's give it a couple of seconds. I see more people joining, so welcome everyone. Uh, let's give it a few moments before everyone gets settled. Okay, I think um, let's get started. Um, hello everyone and welcome to today's session. My name is Florian. I'm the head of business development for GFT Technologies in the APEC region. I'm very happy to be your moderator today. Uh, thank you all for joining our webinar on taking flight with digital banking in Asia. We have four fantastic speeches lined up, followed by a Q&A session. So we have received some very exciting questions from you. Thank you, thank you all. Um, but feel free to post further questions. So just type them in into the chat and we'll try to answer as many as possible during our Q&A. At the end of this session, we'll make sure that a recording of this webinar will be made available to you. So what can we expect today? According to a global survey by The Economist, a large majority of of, of commercial and private banks believe that new technologies like AI and cloud will drive global banking for the next five years. Well, this seems to be common sense, but driven by those technologies, how can financial institutions securely modernize and manage branch, digital, and core banking solutions? Today, we'll gain insights into hybrid, multi-cloud trends and in digital banking, and get in touch with some of the challenges. We will learn how to deploy in a hybrid cloud environment. For example, the, the deployment of Tamanos Transact on Anthos reference architecture. We will dive deeper into the integration of HPE and Anthos, and we're gonna observe how HPE and Anthos power a hybrid cloud platform for Tamanos. So with this exciting agenda, I am delighted to welcome our four speakers. We have, Duncan Foster from Google in Singapore, responsible for, for financial services. So Duncan has over two decades of experience in the cloud and technology industry. He advises customers on adoption of cross Google capabilities for sustained business performance in areas such as application modernization, unlocking insights from data and empowering collaborative cultures. Duncan has been with Google for the last two years and he was the sole driver of the financial services industry in Southeast Asia for banks like DBS, Standard Charter, or URB. He now leads the relationships with global banks like Citi, Goldman Sachs, and HSBC. Welcome, Duncan. Our next speaker is Srikant Shishadri from HPE Hybrid Cloud Services. Srikant is distinguished technologist for HPE Point Next Services, in Asia Pacific. He has over 25 years of experience across system engineering, IT project management, service delivery management, and technology solutions consulting. He is a recognized subject matter expert in the area of hybrid cl cloud transformation. Srikanth is a trusted advisor to a number of banks in APEC and a visionary within hybrid and multi-cloud. A warm welcome. From Tamanos APEC, I'm delighted to introduce Pradut Vatsa, who is a cloud sales specialist. Pradut is a digital native himself and leads the Tamanos Software as a Service initiative in the APEC region. 
He started his career in software engineering at Tata Consultancy Services, followed by sales roles in Oracle and Cognizant before joining Temenos. He lives and breathes cloud computing. So he joined Temenos last year, and since then, he has worked with financial institutions of all shapes and sizes, helping them with their technology journey. Welcome, Pradut. Last but not least, let me introduce my dear colleague, Carl Harvard, head of the Google Cloud Alliance for GFT. For him, it's quite early. <laughs> He's based in London. So Carl is an ex-Googler himself um, and has been in the IT industry for 20 plus years. He has moved from military through technology organizations to cloud compute, data, machine learning, and AI. Carl has worked with many large enterprises across different sectors, and he has helped financial institutions to navigate and manage their on-premise, hybrid, and multi-cloud estates. Now, I would like to hand over to Carl, um, who will take us through trends on the cloud digital journey landscape. I welcome Carl, and let me hand over to you. Thank you, Florian. Um, yes, it is. It's uh, 25 to 5 in the morning over here in the UK, so um, apologies for the dark sky behind. Um, so, so yeah, uh, my, the first 10 minutes is, is me talking, and, and thanks for inviting me, just to, I guess, set the scene of what we're seeing um, around cloud adoption, uh, multi-cloud hybrid trends, but also some of the issues that organizations and enterprises have faced in the Americas and in, in Europe in order that um, I guess those of you in, in APAC can uh, potentially learn from and overcome and not necessarily repeat, repeat the same issues that they face. So the, the, the first stat really, um, which is from the IDC, uh, I don't know if you can flick the next slide please, the, the, there is um, an interesting trend that's happening. So the IDC did some surveys around uh, a number of enterprises, specifically in APAC and the FS uh, financial services industry. And the spending in 2019 reached uh, $5 billion. Uh, but the predicted spend going forward is a compound growth of 30% year on year. So that's, that's quite substantial. Uh, and also a critical mass has sort of been reached already with 65%, so two thirds of financial services organizations now starting to put their workloads and applications onto the, the cloud. And the, the, the column on the right-hand side really is IDC's ideal state. So they, they, they believe that the ideal organization will all be multi-cloud and hybrid, but the mix will be 30% public cloud, 40% private cloud, and the retention of 30% of on-prem uh, non-cloud, um, I guess, core applications residing inside an organization's own environment stroke data centers. Um, breaking that down further onto the next slide, Boston Consulting Group, um, rather than looking at eight packers as a, as, a, as, a, as a single entity on itself, obviously there's lots of different <laughs> regions inside APAC, and they've broken down this cloud adoption uh, uh, by country. And you can see that um, there are different starting points ranging from Japan, all the way through down to Indonesia and Australia. And they looked at the, the rates of growth expected in those regions as well. Uh, the, the, the good news is currently not the largest adoption region, um, but certainly the fastest on, on the globe. So you can probably relate to your own organization here and understand that things aren't gonna stand still. Things are going to move very, very quickly uh, going forward. And, and that, that can pose, pose a problem as we'll, um, as we'll show you in a second. And then the, the next slide looks at the, um, the benefits, you know, what draws people in, um, organizations into adopting cloud and moving into a multi-cloud environment. And the six benefits, which I think most CSPs, cloud service providers, Will, uh, will will portray. But the top two uh, really are probably the ones which, uh, for, from a CEO, from a business point of view, you know, high team productivity and faster time to market, those two things together are the real draw um, to move to cloud. So removing those shackles that have held you back from an IT 
key point of view and adopt the cloud in, in, in an efficient way in order to help you get to market with new products faster, quicker, etc. So the interesting thing is the, the technology is absolutely there today. It's, um, it's, it's being developed at pace. Um, you know, daily we see updates from, from Google, uh, from AWS, from Azure, fantastic technology coming in. But the question really then resides, are enterprises and organizations geared up themselves to be able to adopt this great technology coming down the, down the line? And uh, the next slide is, it's, it's a two year old slide, but it's worth, it's worth highlighting. And that was the, the just over half of enterprises uh, that have adopted cloud um, have stalled or even had to uh, start again. They've failed there through their cloud adoption. Um, you know, I think AWS call it the big stall. Uh, Google, I think, refers to the term the digital deadlock I've heard over in Europe. Uh, GFT, we call it the cloud chasm because it is a chasm to, to, to cross over in order to adopt it. Uh, and the reasons and issues being faced are not, is not the technology. It's the complexity of, of changing an organization, changing its mindset in order, in order to be able to think slightly differently from on-premise into cloud. Um, also maybe change those processes. And the, the big thing we're seeing in the marketplace globally is the lack of skills to be, um, to be readily available to help organizations actually make the move. Um, so this is two years ago. The next slide is a little bit more up to date. And you know, most organizations have now crossed that chasm. Um, you know, nine out of 10 have, uh, and you think, well, you know, good news, <laughs> they've made it. But actually the, the other side of that chasm is not a simple environment. It's, it's a hugely complex environment. And if you look at the, um, the APAC stats here, then, you know, 93% of organizations are now find themselves in the multi-cloud and hybrid environment. So a very, very complex environment indeed, uh, to, not just to manage, but to continually, um, I guess, evolve and update. You know, what, what, where, where does the business place its priorities? What workloads should be deployed on what cloud? How is that spread across the different clouds and the different regions to to suit and, and offer the best possible services to your customers? So, um, crossing that chasm was the utopia. Most organisations now done it and find themselves in this really complex world. And and the next slide really in, in um, uh, highlights uh, nine out of ten have moved, but less than a third actually now have in place uh, the ability to manage this multi-cloud environment. You know they haven't necessarily invested in the tools to be able to view their whole IT estate, on-prem, private cloud, public cloud, and be able to manage the applications, the utilization, even the billing um, uh, effectively enough. And therefore, I think when I hand over to Duncan in, in a moment, he'll be able to talk about Anthos, which is a perfect way of actually uh, having that single pane of glass to manage these environments. Um, the next slide then talks about something we couldn't predict. Um, and it hit APAC obviously first, and uh, globally, we're now all suffering from it. Um, but it's actually served as a, as a catalyst. So the new C, C in the C-suite, the COVID-19 or, or Corona, um, has actually forced enterprises to think very differently, uh, much faster than they probably anticipated, and to adopt various uh, applications and, and, and aspects of the cloud um, in a much faster way because of the ability to um, I guess, look at hardware as software. So you, using the console to program, get applications quickly into the cloud, rather than having to rely upon your on-prem and IT teams, you probably can't necessarily get into the environment to manage it effectively. So just short of two thirds actually have, uh, because of COVID, have accelerated their adoption into the cloud. And this acceleration has probably compounded some of the issues that uh, from a process and a mindset and even a boardroom perspective you know they've had to really really force the agenda let, let's call it that um, the next slide then talks about the fragmentation across the cloud and we, we, we everyone does talk about multi-cloud and hybrid and it does mean different things to different organizations i guess the in the purest form a hybrid multi-cloud environment you would see applications run across the entire estate Unfortunately, what's happening is just over half organizations still operate their apps in a siloed way. So um, 
uh, GCP may be looking at machine learning and AI in one area. You may be doing some lift and shift with another cloud. You know, you may be actually retaining your data because your data center contracts on prem and having to actually manage that moving around of data, which in itself can cause um, issues that give the CISO maybe some headaches. And 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 the next slide then sort of reflects um, that from a holistic point of view. And if there's one slide, I think, from the recording, which may be useful to you, this is a, 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 an online a, a digital banking environment. And it looks at the, the, from the inside, the IT estate, through the business process, through the things like compliance that, that you as an organization have to look after. And there's two tensions at play here. From top to bottom, you've got you as a digital bank needing to offer the best possible customer experience, but also um, ensure that your business is, remains efficient and profitable uh, and the tensions at play and how you deliver that. And then from left to right, the ability for you as an organization to innovate um, is absolutely key to set yourself apart, introduce new products into the marketplace, et cetera. But of course, diametrically opposed to that on the left-hand side, you've still got to have that regu regulatory compliance and make sure you adhere to all the necessary uh, legislation in your sector and in your region as well. Um, uh, th this slide is actually probably half a day's session in itself, but we'll leave, the, we'll leave it here for the time being. And, and, and the final thing then is just to highlight in the boardroom then, and if, if you can build out the, the, the boardroom uh, and the different roles that are in play here, you know, around the table in the digital um, banking boardroom, you've got the CIO and CTO looking at how to bring innovation to life doing many POCs, proof of concepts, and actually being challenged to say, well, that POC was great. Now let's get it live into production. Some organizations then have to then start again to bake in the security and the compliance um, in order to deliver it to market and make it production ready. And the more POCs you do without thing, having compliance and security in mind, the more you compound that issue. You've then got the CDO uh, on a big enterprise, and we work uh, you know, a lot of, of global enterprises, but also with some big banks over in APAC, where uh, there's many t delivery teams dotted around the various regions, all doing things in slightly different ways, maybe duplicating effort. So how do you bring conformity and uniformity to, to, to that way of working you know, in a proper DevOps uh, uh, I guess pipeline um, way of managing that in order to make sure, you know, your production ready uh, environments can go live and actually be taken advantage of by the other teams across the uh, the region. And then you've got the CEO, um, and what we're seeing a lot of actually is those six benefits that we highlighted earlier. The CEO is now starting to question those. He or she is saying, "Well, hang on a minute." Um, I thought I was supposed to go to market much faster. I thought I was supposed to innovate much faster as well. Um, and I'm, I'm just being held back by this complexity. Um, and then moving further to, to, to the right, you know, you've got the extreme right. You've got the CISO wanting to absolutely make sure that their organization is robust. There's no loopholes, et cetera, et cetera. So that diagram that preceded this slide is reflected in those conversations through the boardroom. My final slide before I hand over to Duncan is, you know, there is good news. Uh, so even though you may relate to some of those issues in the marketplace um, and in your own organization, you know, Google, Temenos, HPE have evolved their products and services to address these issues uh, for you. And I, and I think the having worked with Anthos, Anthos in the last 18 months, deployed it myself with the teams over in the UK, um, We've seen significant benefits, and the organization we've worked with, a few stock exchanges, a few banks, has seen real benefit from deploying Anthos and managing that multi-cloud and hybrid environment. So with that, I'll pass over to Duncan, if that's okay. Uh, thank you very much, Carl. Uh, very much appreciate the intro and the kind words about uh, the work and experience you've already had with Google Cloud and with Anthos. Uh, so with that, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Duncan Foster. And I'm here to talk about the Google Cloud side of things. And in Google Cloud, we work with financial institutions all over the world, in, in APAC, in EMEA, in the Americas, and in all different types of uh, financial institution. If we're looking at banking, we'll deal with the retail banking, institutional banking, investment banking. And that means clients request. like 
Uh, it could be uh, ANZ, it could be uh, Deutsche Bank, it could be Goldman Sachs. But today we're going to talk specifically about one capability within Google Cloud out of the hundreds we have, and that is Anthos. So next slide, please. So Anthos is the bringing of Google's own innovation as to how we operate to other organizations. It's a pure software capability that allows you to span Google Cloud, on-premises, uh, other cloud capabilities, and at the edge. And this capability means that you're able to leverage investments you've already made in on-premises environments without locking yourselves into particular hardware. But then we're an open platform as well. It's built on Google innovation. It's using capabilities like Kubernetes so that you can run your workloads anywhere in a consistent, secure, but also flexible manner. Um, we'll dive into a little bit more detail to understand how exactly Anthos allows you to realize those benefits. So when we talk about open, it allows the separation through Anthos as a layer of abstraction between your underpinning infrastructure and the application that runs on top of it. And this decoupling gives you the portability and the flexibility that you're seeking without having to be so concerned about redesigning and redeploying your application based upon the hardware, the infrastructure, or even the cloud platform that it's running on top of. But Anthos alone is not that. It's also a consistent control plane that you can use for all of your applications, not just one specific application. That allows you to introduce automation, uh, security, and it gives you the ability to reconcile what is deployed in your environment, irrespective of the infrastructure that is deployed upon. As we're in the financial services space, we know that hybrid is the way forward. We've just seen from Carl uh, the talk about the use of multi-cloud. So Anthos is allowing you to do just that. And you can start the journey to cloud now, even in an on-premises environment. Because by deploying Anthos on top of your on-premises stack, it allows you to modernize in place to improve your capabilities so that you're cloud ready or even cloud native before you necessarily migrate the actual infrastructure underneath to the cloud. We're also providing the capability to support as well as that hybrid cloud, multi-cloud. So you can deploy on top of Google Cloud Platform, but also other cloud platforms, for example, on top of AWS. When you're looking at this from a regulatory perspective, you're considering things like concentration risk. This is obviously going to be vital because it doesn't mean you're just using different cloud providers within your business, but you're actually able to migrate workload from one cloud provider to another without needing to make any changes in your application. So for the regulators that are getting ahead of the curve, they're looking not just at what is the uh, risk from having multiple cloud providers, but do you actually have portability to be able to move between those providers? Because that's what uh, the concern is all around the risk. And of course, because you then have this consistent platform that you're building upon, no matter where your workloads or where your applications are going to be deployed, this allows you to accelerate your application innovation. Um, you're only deploying for one particular platform. You don't have to worry about deploying on multitudes of different platforms. And Anthos comes within it a whole suite of capabilities to accelerate your application development cycles. So the, the time from conception to production is significantly reduced and you can accelerate your own innovation cycles and you can go from responding from something in the market to something being available to your customers in an incredibly short period of time. And next slide, please. So as we start to look at, well, what does this mean for Anthos and Temenos? And remember, uh, Temenos is certified to run on Anthos. Okay? So uh, Google and Temenos have worked together to say, Terminos is certified to run on top of Anthos, so you can use this as your abstraction layer, as your control plane, as your capability. 
And these are five examples of the things you can do. So you're able to then burst between on-premises and cloud. A lot of people want to use the investments they've already made on-premises, but on-premises can sometimes only provide you with a steady state in terms of the transaction volumes you're dealing with. Using the combination of Temenos and Anthos, you can burst in times of peak load out onto the cloud, knowing that because you have Anthos, you have that consistency layer so that it's easy for you to do so, and then scale back down as the transaction volume decreases. Secondly, you can set up active active environments. So let's take an example again between on-premises and cloud. Both can be running on the Anthos platform and therefore your disaster recovery can be active active. You're leveraging all of that infrastructure capability, both on-premises and on the cloud. So you're not in a situation where you're paying for something that isn't actually being used, which is unfortunately still very, very common in a disaster recovery scenario. Um, we talked about modernizing in place. So Temenos on top of Anthos gives you a much more modern platform to be working on. And you can use that modernized microservices type architecture for hybrid deployments, where again, it doesn't matter whether you're deploying on premises, whether you're deploying on cloud, or even which cloud you're deploying on, which is the next point around multi-cloud capability. Again, I touched on this earlier when I talked about concentration risk but the ability to deploy across multiple cloud providers with that abstraction, with that common control plane, means that you can focus on deploying Terminos how you want to deploy it, not putting in lots of work and lots of cycles for deploying it on a specific infrastructure provider. And we also talked about how this helps speed up your software development, your software delivery. Again, your focus is on going to be getting the most out of Terminos, not in terms of customizing and configuring Terminos to run on a particular cloud platform, on a particular on-premises environment, rejigging it again to work in a disaster recovery environment. All of that's been taken care of by Anthos. And just to uh, take that into the next level of detail, if you go to the next slide, please, we have built out a reference architecture for Terminos to run on Anthos for a hybrid deployment. This ensures that you have all of the consistency around the monitoring, the logging, the security, but you also have the ability to scale and just auto scale as required, as dictated by the volumes and the transaction load that you're getting. Okay. So in this instance, we've already done a lot of the hard work to give you the confidence to be able to deploy Terminos on top of Anthos. We've heard some of the benefits of Anthos that I've spoken to. Carl has also given you some of the proof points from the things GFT have experienced with Anthos. But you can go into this with the confidence that you're, you don't have to be a trailblazer, but you are modernizing your core banking capability for a cloud native future without having to sacrifice all of the infrastructure investments you've already made in your existing on-premises environment. And with that, uh, I will then pass over to my colleague uh, Pradeep, who's going to speak much more about Temenos in the cloud and how you can then take advantage of those capabilities on top of that Anthos platform. Pradeep, over to you. Thank you very much, Duncan. And thanks to Carl and Florian as well for the kind words and warm introduction. Uh, also, Duncan, thanks a lot for acknowledging the work that Temenos has done with uh, the Google Cloud Platform Anthos capabilities. I think it sets a nice platform for me to talk about a little bit more about our journey into the world of putting banking platforms, whether it be front office, middle office, or back office on public cloud. And then more specifically diving deep into our partnership with the, uh, with the Anthos technologies. So as, as I go into that, I mean, thing that I really want to stress upon the set on the session today is what really were our motivations? Why did we decide to invest? And why we think it makes sense for, uh, 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 for you as a digital bank. So on this slide that we have, that, that's there on the screen, we have talked about the journey that Temenos has taken. Uh, we are a 25 year old organization. I think all of us on the call will acknowledge that. Uh, and uh, cloud computing and anything remotely similar to that did not exist back then. 
So it was more of a traditional client server architecture. And in the, the, it was the era, it was the world in which Temenos was born in. And then it moved gradually along the N-tier or the three-tier architecture that we talk about. And then transformed into a cloud, um, working on cloud kind of, kind of architecture, deployment architecture. Eventually today, uh, in 2019, we launched our cloud native, cloud agnostic uh, uh, platform, uh, Terminos software, which works across all the three hyperscale providers. Now, this has been a momentous journey for us. And I think this transformation has very much been in line with how people have done banking. That has fundamentally changed. The brick and mortar banks of the past has given way to uh, mobile phones being your single conduit to do your banking services. That's become your single pane of glass. That's all you care about as a customer. I don't remember myself the last time I logged into my banking account through a laptop. So it's just been my voice ID, my face ID, and my iPhone, with which I have, uh, I have logged into my bank account. And that's how I've interacted with them. And I'm sure that's the case with a lot of you. What that has done fundamentally is it has sparked ambitions of enterprising individuals and organizations to explore the white space that traditional banks have not served in the past. And voila, digital banks were born, new banks were born, challenger banks were born. All of these characterized by two broad properties that we acknowledged at Temenos. The need or the desire to offer differentiated products and the entire ecosystem to be powered by technology. And Everything that we did at Temenos as we did this journey from 1993 to 2019 that you see on the screen was, was, was underpinned by these two things. To help our customers offer differentiated products and to help, and to help them do this by the power of technology. And that's how Temenos approached it. We wanted to remove friction for people to launch these products. And we wanted to radically change our own technology so that we could then offer this to our customers. And that's the genesis of our whole cloud story. Next slide, please. Now, with that underpinning and with that motivation, because that's very important at a, at a very big level, high level, 10,000 feet level, that's what helped us plow in 20%, nearly 20% of our year on year profits into our ND investments. Because there was significant technical debt to overcome. We acknowledged that we were we are a 25 year old organization. So we needed to change a lot of things. We needed to change how we build software. We needed to change how we thought of our customers who consume this software. And above what you see on the slide is a portfolio of Temenos products that we have today. We have everything from Infinity to, uh, uh, which is our front office platform to Transact, which is our back office platform to Wealth, which is our wealth platform to data and analytics and so on. And through organic and inorganic investments, we take great pride in the fact that today we are able to offer all of this on cloud. And I mean, who would have thought? I mean, talk, talk to the leaders who have been around for 25 years and they would be surprised with the strides that we have made. Hardcore traditional capabilities in the world of banking, collections, core banking, funds administration, payments, they have been systemically targeted by Terminos. We have unlearned and relearned as an organization things so that we can put these capabilities on, on, onto cloud computing. And all of this change being powered from the top, right from our CEO to the newest kid on the block. What we have acknowledged and believed is the truly transformative power of cloud. And that's where all of our investments have gone into. Next slide, please. But it's been a while, right? I mean, it's 25 years, like I said. And I started talking, uh, I said 93, and then I say 2013 when we were cloud ready and it was around 2012, 2010, when we started talking about, uh, we started running our first workloads on cloud. And obviously non-production workloads. Back then there was, there was no way that someone could have done a proper bank into and from production instance on a, on a cloud platform, a public cloud platform. Those were early days for even our uh, hyperscale cloud providers. But what we also realized as we did this 10 year old journey, so we're now 10 years old as a cloud company, while we are 25 years old as a banking company, what we realized is that all of this exists in a highly regulated environment. We can't just stand in a vacuum and in an isolation and do some fancy work and then go out to our customers and say, hey, try running this. Because if it fails, it has a lot of ripple effects to, in the entire ecosystem. 
and we need to be cognizant of a whole set of central, regional, and org specific laws. We need to also be cognizant of millions that are plowed into existing infrastructure investments in the form of hardware, data center, bespoke custom applications. I mean, look at the amount of .NET application footprints that a lot of our large legacy customers have. And we need to be aware that Temenos is one critical piece in the story, but it's not the whole story itself. The end goal is not just to buy Temenos software, it's to be able to buy a set of capabilities from a set of vendors eventually to be able to offer those digital banking services to your customers. And these services could be Temenos services, ERPs, HR systems, uh, Salesforce automation systems, and so on and so forth. But how do you stitch all of this heterogeneity together? How do you bring all of this together? And that's where comes in the very important piece of further drilling down into our partnership with Google, what is more colloquially called as the GCP or Google Cloud Platform and the Anthos, Anthos capabilities. We acknowledge that, this with, that with this heterogeneity, we had to solve for multi-cloud scenarios. We had to solve for hybrid cloud scenarios. We had to solve for unique cases like cloud burst stability, some a customer not ready to come on public cloud, but then wants to leverage it in case a black swan or a white swan event happens. We need to solve for new, uh, uh, new cutting edge situations. What if somebody wants an active active configuration to mitigate risk across these hyperscale providers? Again, all of this circling back to our original motivation, the ability to help our customers offer differentiated products using with the power of technology. And this is what spurred our investments with Anthos because Anthos provides us that capability, like Duncan rightly said, to offer that single pane of glass across all of your Terminos workload investments, whether running on public cloud, whether running on on-premises, all in a hybrid, hybrid network kind of a model, brought together and and being delivered to your end consumers. Again, whether front office, back office, or middle office, consumed, consumed by your customers in the, in the most optimized manner possible. I think with that, I will pass on to Srikant. Thanks a lot for listening to me. And I hope we have uh, given you some, some points to ponder over as, as, as you take away from this call. Thank you. Over to you, Srikant. Yeah, thanks Pradyut uh, for, the, for the introduction and thanks uh, Florian. My fellow panelists, uh, Carl, Duncan and Pradyut spoke about bringing digital banking functions on multi-cloud. Let me focus on areas related to deployment, operations, optimizations and consumption of the multi-cloud platform, uh, which here is Anthos. HPE defined the need for hybrid IT for every type of business five years back uh, and our strategy for hybrid cloud is based on right mix. Right mix in our definition is about providing the right cloud delivery models for right set of applications and data. So in this slide, um, we talk about the core capabilities of Anthos. So we understand that the core capabilities required for digital banking systems are based on microservices, access using APIs, running on containers, delivered using fully automated platforms, following a DevOps processes and tools. As shared by Duncan and then by Pradyut, Google Anthos offered some excellent capabilities to support the right foundation for the digital banking platform, whether it is enterprise grade container orchestration or automated policy and security management at Skype, a fully managed service mesh or edge to cloud, <clears throat> edge to hybrid and multi-cloud deployment. HPE helps to adopt Google Anthos in three different ways. So we helped to move to cloud where HPE can help to adopt Google Anthos on hybrid or multi-cloud environment using its validated infrastructure solutions, whether it's on-premises or on any multi-cloud. And also leveraging on the adoption frameworks and the expertise that we have around cloud native tools, uh, we could help the adoption of uh, Anthos platform much more seamlessly and we de-risk the whole implementation. With Innovate in Cloud, HPE works with financial institutions to leverage the continuous innovation offered by Anthos in the area of cloud native computing, uh, AI and machine learning, high performance compute, as well as on, on the edge computing part. And then lastly, the third area where we could help our financial institutions is run the cloud. 
where HPE will provide a consumption-based model for Anthos multi-cloud platform and deliver a complete managed services and a customer's term. Let me move on to the next slide to talk a little bit more about the consumption model for um, Anthos multi-cloud platform. Our consumption model is called as HP GreenLake and we have extended this to Google Anthos platform. With HP GreenLake, it allows you to consume and pay for the complete multi-cloud Anthos environment on a pay as you use basis. And HP GreenLake for Anthos includes HP infrastructure, Google Anthos, and all the services required for delivering this multi-cloud platform. And all of this can be included in the GreenLake consumption pricing model. With this Green Lake, there is no upfront traditional purchase. Instead, we roll all of this into a monthly price. As your capacity needs increases, HP monitors available capacity and automatically ships and installs additional capacity to maintain an agreed amount of capacity so you can continue to grow as needed. At all times, you only pay for what you use. You never pay for extra capacity that is installed on your premise until you start using it. Now that's GreenLake uh, model for consumption. Let me now move on to the next slide where we talk about how we can help you with the operations, which involves run, operate, and optimize the Anthos environment. We call this as HPE GreenLake management services. So we offer monitoring, administration, operations, advisory and optimization of Anthos multi-cloud environment. GreenLake Management Services offers this service using a combination of people, process and tools delivered at every customer's term. We increase business agility with AI-driven insights. Our people drives faster business results by having a full stack expertise and delivering a premium support. We help to reduce risk with uh, predictable real-time responses to monitoring alerts and delivering continuous improvement. So all of these service delivery capabilities are backed by all the leading industry certifications that's relevant for cloud, as well as for security, as well as for operations. And we have been delivering consistent KPIs across several quarters to all our customers. And, and we deliver this service on a global operating model. Today, we have the delivery capability and capacity across all the major countries in APAC. Of course, Singapore, Australia, Korea, and all the big ASEAN markets. In summary, we can be your partner to adopt Anthos on multi-cloud to run Temenos, which can be offered on a consumption model with a complete managed services delivered at your terms. So, Thank you for this uh, session and let me hand this over back to Florian. Thank you, thank you Srikant and all of the speakers for the great presentations and the exciting insights. So let's now get right into the Q&A session, being mindful of time. Um, before and during the webinar, we had received some very interesting questions, which I would like now to pose to our four panelists. And even though the first question is a Google related one, um, I will not ask Duncan, so I'll pass it on to Freecamp and Pradut. Um, why would financial institutions go with Google Cloud? And what are the key benefits when we compare Google with their competitors? Yeah, Florian, let me take it on this uh, first, uh, and Pradut can add on to it. Um, first of all, uh, let me put a disclaimer here that HPE is a cloud platform agnostic provider and has been helping financial institutions to adopt multi-cloud. Having said that, right, Google Cloud, what we are seeing that is having, coming up with very, very strong offerings and it's running into hundreds and a lot of new things are coming as we are talking now around the cloud native uh, application platforms and on the data platforms. And when we do application portfolio assessments with our customers, we see, especially with the financial institutions, we see Google Cloud platform scoring pretty much high scores for specific type of capabilities are required for delivering both the traditional as well as the cloud native applications. And with Google Anthos platform, which we have been talking about in the last few minutes, uh, seems to have a very strong multi-cloud deployment uh, model for the applications and data. And that's, that's, that's where we see uh, Google Anthos multi-cloud as a sweet spot for the financial institutions uh, to adopt both the traditional as well as the cloud native applications.
Uh, if I have to give my two cents, the reason I would I would uh, go bet big on Google Cloud or what I like to call this GCP is simply because uh, while while I did mention at that the journey that we have done, we are we are cloud native, cloud agnostic soft software solution. The clear benefit that I see with Google Cloud again is one that uh, Srikanth rightly talks about you know, multi cloud and hybrid cloud capabilities. So specifically customers use cases scenarios where uh, you have to uh, you have to look at uh, sev uh, different kinds of uh, a very uh, heterogeneity in terms of uh, infrastructure available number one and number two some of these te fundamental technologies for example kubernetes that we talked about as a as an orchestrator and uh, 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 things like that were born at google itself so it, the, the, the nativity of these solutions lends itself very nicely to the Google platform as opposed to the other hyperscale providers. So while I can understand that while on surface it will appear as if all these three hyperscale vendors are one and the same and they, at the end of the day, set up boxes for you, the, 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 these managed capabilities for some of these solutions that, that uh, are more native to Google simply just gives us some compelling benefits as, as a software, as a software uh, vendor. Thank you, Bardud. And we continue with you with the second, uh, with the second question, um, uh, a Tamanos related question. So has uh, Tamanos Transact truly containerized function, functions or is it rather a monolith wrapped into a container? Hmm. Good question. Yeah, um, well, I'll be honest. Uh, it's a journey and I, I would be the first one to say we're not there at the end of it. Uh, we started with the whole, uh, first thing is we have to under take a step back and understand that you don't just overnight become a, become a container ready microservices architected software from after doing years and years of your three tier and N tier architecture and whatnot, right? So Temenos was, it was, all, was a monolith, I was the first one to admit, but the last two, two and a half years, we have been stripping away at business functionality from the software to say which parts makes sense to architect as a microservice based architecture versus which are best left as a monolith. So that we are on the journey and not there completely yet. And uh, I, would, I would even raise my hand and say, it may not make sense for us to completely go the microservices route. I mean, it's hostess for courses at the end of the day. We just don't want to uh, uh, stick on to a uh, stick on to uh, a, a principle because it's in vogue. It has to make sense to us and to our customers. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Pradut. This, this is a very uh, transparent and open answer. I appreciate that. So Duncan, let me ask you, how did the global pandemic change the mindset on digital banking from the perspective of the end client, but also from the perspective of the decision makers? Uh, thank you, Florian. Um, it's been quite interesting to see the effects in the short term, but even more so in the long term. So when the pandemic first hit, or really when people started shifting to working from home, and there was a lot of sheltering in place taking place, the initial reaction was that this was a short term measure. And whilst people were pushed to use a lot of remote and digital capabilities uh, in the near term, they'd be reverting back to their previous habits uh, as soon as the pandemic was over. And this was very much in the early days when I think at that time, people didn't really think through how long an extended period of time of remote activity might be required. And certainly the surveys and the information that we saw suggested that people did not expect to change their long-term habits. Interestingly, as the pandemic has continued, and as people were required to shelter in place for longer, their attitudes started to shift. So after repeating the same kind of surveys two or three months later, we saw there was a trend where people that had now become much more familiar with using remote working, uh, remote access to financial institutions, to banking services, they saw themselves as continuing to use those even after the pandemic was over. So it took some time for them to shift from a mindset of, 
I'll just go back to doing what I was doing before to this is the new way of working and I expect to continue to engage with my institution in that manner. Um, so there's a couple of lessons there I would learn uh, if I were in a financial institution's shoes uh, from that customer behavior. So one is that uh, the world has shifted. So we should not assume that people are going to go back to their previous ways of working, uh, even when those do become available to them, uh, whenever that might be. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, uh, because this is something that should reverberate for the long term and is not specific just to the pandemic, but it actually took a couple of months of people working in a different way, having a different experience to change their mindset, to change their perceptions, to change their behavior. So whilst a lot of uh, leaders and managers and institutions have been trying to uh, drive their customer base towards engaging in a far more digital manner, what we've seen with the pandemic is people do it when they're forced to do it, but they don't take it up as a new habit. And it actually takes a couple of months for people to learn this as a new behavior, to learn this as a new habit. So for those in the financial institutions, they need to think about how, if they want their customers to make this shift to digital, which most of them do, how do you create an environment such that people are incentivized to do so for a period an extended period, probably a couple of months at least, so that it becomes second nature, so that it becomes habit, rather than throwing out one-off incentives or one-off promotions that will only result in a handful of transactions and allow people very easily to fall back onto their own way of doing things. Uh, that I think has been the most uh, interesting learning. Thank you, Duncan, for the very detailed answer. Uh, is there anything to add from, from you, Freekant and Carl in that, in that order? Um, yeah, Florian. So I think uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, COVID joins the C-suite in terms of making the digital transformation calls in all the businesses. Uh, whether it's an, and it's digital first or digital last. That's the new uh, way of how the businesses are looking at digital, right? I, I, I totally agree with uh, Duncan uh, in terms of uh, uh, motivations uh, that's been put on people to consume digital experiences uh, offered by the various financial institutions. There has been several uh, motivations uh, in terms of enabling them, helping them to learn, helping them to adopt. And I think, uh, and slowly with these uh, 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 tremendous support offered by uh, various cross section of the industries, I think people across all spectrum of the society uh, are now uh, motivated, encouraged, and they also realize that that's a new normal and they got to, they got to uh, consume digital experiences uh, uh, in a way moving forward. So, so just the just two cents on, on this particular point. Yeah. Yeah, and I would add very briefly, um, Florian, um, because of COVID and, and the change of behavior it's enforced, uh, the next time someone needs to do something a bit more uh, radical on the cloud, maybe the barrier and the, and the risk associated to it has diminished now because a lot of organizations have actually gone through that because they were forced to. So I think it may have accelerated cloud adoption in the longer term, actually. Thank you, Carl, and uh, thank you, Srikant, for, for, the, for the answers. So speaking about cloud adoption, the topic of compliance always pops up. Srikant, can I give it to you uh, and ask, how can we actually maintain compliance in the digital arena? Uh, you said it uh, pretty well, Florian. Uh, so obviously when we're talking about digital arena, cloud is becoming a more of a catalyst or a foundation uh, based on which a number of digital initiatives are uh, being uh, being done today, right? So, so from a HPE perspective, specifically on cloud compliance, so we provide a very comprehensive set of assessment and roadmap services to help financial institutions to address compliances as part of the cloud adoption. I think we don't stop there, right? So that's the first part of the adopting, I mean, addressing the compliance. The second part of uh, adopting the cloud compliance is that we do what we call it as a continuous compliance control, right? As part of this continuous compliance control, we help to work with the financial institute uh, to provide monitoring controls, uh, monitoring control and improve the compliances relevant for cloud, various cloud platforms, right? So on an ongoing basis so that, whatever compliances that they start with is continuously addressed. And if there are more changes coming, 
down, which is, which is the, again, the new normal, uh, we, we help to address it. Thank you very much. The next question is a very exciting one that also came from the audience. So thank you for, for posting that. Um, how do you see the role of microservices architecture driving the transformation of digital banking services? Let's start with Pradut and then over to Duncan. Right, I mean, there is definitely, microservices definitely has a role to play. I think uh, there is a fair amount of, uh, fair amount of, uh, I would say noise around this, around this whole uh, work, term itself or this jargon itself. And we need to see that through, but uh, from a purely digital front office perspective. So when I'm talking about uh, uh, what the, what you see is what you get, the customer forms and templates and so on and so forth. The journeys that you have for, for let's say, for a, for, a, for a bunch of banking products, whether it's mortgage or whether it's uh, personal loans or retail banking and things like that, there is definitely a role for microservices uh, based kind of architecture to be there because what then happens is you take these, uh, these services and you, um, and in each individual service performing a specific function. And uh, uh, you then expose them to the customer. And there is, uh, it helps you build a lot of redundancy. If there is in real time, uh, there is some sort of, you know, uh, uh, downtime or if there is one of the services not working, they can be quickly brought down, repaired, brought back up while the rest of the application continues working uh, in an expected manner. So uh, so from a customer experience perspective, what we say UX perspective, there's a lot of definite value in microservices side of things. Back office and middle office is exactly where Temenos, I think as an organization and even myself personally as a professional, we're not very convinced about what role microservices uh, uh, our architecture can typically play. Because I think uh, uh, I think there we go more for uh, uh, consistency and uh, less for uh, less for rapid development and rapid deployment and those kind of scenarios. So yeah, it's a mix and mi it's a mixed bag, and we'll have to see how that evolves. But front office definitely, and that's where Temenos is uh, investing a lot from a microservices perspective as well. Over to you, Duncan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I would take a slightly different perspective because from the Google side, we we love microservices. You know, microservices-based architecture is uh, certainly fundamental to how we do business. Um, but it's interesting to see that uh, dynamic between what Purdue describes, particularly in the back office. For us, microservices mean that things are no longer tightly coupled. So a particular capability, a particular piece of uh, functionality, a service can exist independently of everything else. And that independence gives you a lot more flexibility, it gives you a lot more agility. So because you have that capability, it means that if that particular component is, uh, for example, is becoming a source of a bottleneck, microservices architecture allow you to scale out the, uh, you know, the amount of compute capability and the number of nodes that are providing that particular microservice so that you eliminate that bottleneck aspect without having to necessarily scale out all of your other uh, infrastructure aspects to deal with um, an entire monolith for only one narrow bottleneck. Another example is the fact that it becomes the, able to far more uh, rapidly increase the upgrade cycle, uh, increase the innovation for that particular service. If you've got this with a very well-defined boundary, you know, you've got very clear sort of API contract for that particular microservice, it means you're able to do your internal engineering, your internal improvements, be able to prove that it still adheres to that contract and deploy into production incredibly rapidly. And certainly within Google, we push thousands of changes into production on a daily basis. We've got away from that uh, very traditional approach of you know, maybe one big large monolithic release that comes in uh, once a quarter or something like that. So the microservices based architecture is, it's a mechanism, it's a technique to give you greater flexibility, to give you greater agility, and therefore it really speeds up your innovation cycle. And, and that we believe is just as important for us as it is for any other business, and certainly uh, for those financial institutions that are looking to compete in a far more 
innovative and far more dynamic, fast paced and changing world. Thank you, Duncan. And I think we have time for a last question for Carl and Shrikan. So what are the biggest challenges when it comes to adopting cloud services and banking? And what are the priorities for readiness? Do you want me to add first comment, Florian? Um, I, I, I think what we've seen um, as GFT uh, across the financial service, but mainly the banking area, is, um, is twofold. The, the, the biggest barriers we see is, is the change in mindset. So helping the leadership team inside the, the organization actually think in a slightly different way, you know, treating hardware as software uh, as code ra rather than um, thinking of it in the, in, in the traditional way um, and moving that mindset from lift and shift to actually um, improve and then move, I guess, guess is the phrase you could use. But the other, the other barrier to slowing things down is, is, the, is the skill set and the lack of skills we're seeing globally across all the um all, all, all industries actually and uh, it, it's great for companies like us because obviously we invest heavily in that area but we do we do go into organizations who are in their i guess different stages of maturity when it comes to cloud multi-cloud migration and uh, they are sort of struggling because it's probably the first time they've really done it so um adding and helping them get the right resources and right skills has helped them move faster than they typically would do. Yeah, I think uh, I fully agree with Carl. So I think he, he touched upon quite a number of areas. Uh, I, in From my perspective or from our perspective in HPE, we see people-related challenges as the biggest thing in, in cloud adoption because people from all spectrum of the organization, all across the organization, needs to have a complete appreciation and be convinced of the value of cloud that brings to the business. I think that's where uh, uh, people so sometimes look at it as a siloed technology project, or so people uh, look at it as an operational project, and they get to do things right. Uh, then, so so people people are, uh, challenges. The first thing that needs to be addressed, and following that, I think uh, Carl touched upon the technology aspects in terms of application and data modernization, right? And 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 of course, uh, the process and the governance part also needs to be covered because people tend to adopt for private cloud, hybrid cloud, and multi cloud, but end up running it like another data center operations, which is not the right way to do to get the harness the benefit of the cloud, right? So. Yep, that's that's what for me. Okay, um, that brings us basically to the end of the Q and A session and to the end of the webinar. I hope you all have enjoyed the session, the deep insights that we gained into cloud strategy and digital banking. We will share the recording um, after this session. For further questions, obviously, please feel free to to contact us to reach out. Uh, a very a very big thank you to the four fantastic speakers as well as the Tamanos team for making this happen. So thanks everyone for attending. Stay safe and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye.